Good afternoon, good morning, well, uh, colleagues. You're all very welcome. A special word of welcome to our host, uh, Director of the Research Unit, Professor Elsa Menz. Welcome to NWU staff members and academics. I'm sure that more people will be joining us uh, as we lead up with the introductions. Uh, also welcome to local international university staff members and also um, other colleagues. A uh, special word of welcome to uh, Dr. Glenda Cox, UNESCO Chair in Open Education and Social Justice, and also Igor Lesko from Open Education Global. Thank you for joining us today. This lecture is part of Northwest University's Open Education Week celebrations, so we are really glad that you can join us specifically for this purpose. And then uh, before I give an opportunity for Dr. Donovan Kruger to introduce our two um, speakers today, a warm welcome to you as well, uh, Professor Tom, Professor Trudy. Um, they are extraordinary professors at Northwest and we are really glad for them to share their expertise with us today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Donovan. Thank you very much, Prof. Jakun. So we welcome Prof. Trudy, uh, Prof. Thomas Mackey and Prof. Trudy Jacobson, who published their new book for ALA and Neil Schumann entitled Metaliteracy in a Connected World, Developing Learners as Producers, uh, as can also be seen from the background of Prof. Thomas. Prof. Thomas Mackey is a professor of arts and media in the School of Arts and Humanities at the State University of New York Empire State College at, in the USA, and is the Dr. Susan H. Turban Chair in Mentoring. His research focuses on metaliteracy, a pedagogical framework he originated for, uh, with uh, Prof. Jacobson, which develops individuals uh, as self-directed learners in participatory information environments. Prof. Mackey is interested in the intersections, intersections among uh, uh, metaliteracy, meta self-directed learning, and multimodality to prepare metaliterate learners as collaborative and informed producers of information. He has published extensively, including multiple books and peer-reviewed articles. Prof. Mackey teaches online courses in the digital arts and has developed several international MOOCs about metaliteracy. Uh, Prof. Trudy Jacobson is a distinguished librarian emerita at the University of Albany, State University of New York. She has been deeply involved with teaching and information literacy throughout her career and co-chaired the Association of College and Research Libraries Task Force that created the framework for information literacy for higher education. Prof. Jacobson is interested in exploring the relationship between open pedagogy, meta-literacy, and self-directed learning. She regularly uh, taught an information literacy course for upper-level undergraduates that used Wikipedia editing as a way to understand the core concepts of meta-literacy and information literacy. She serves as a mentor each semester to an instructor new to teaching using Wikipedia. Uh, she is the co-author and or co-editor of 14 books, including four about meta-literacy and received the ACRL Miriam Dudley Instruction Award in 2009. Now, with this backdrop uh, of those praiseworthy accolades, colleagues, we look forward to this prestige lecture. lecture. Thank you very much, Prof. Mackey and Prof. Jacobson. Thank you very much, Professor Kruger. Um, we are delighted to be here with you today and are looking forward to um, sharing some of our work with you and then um, engaging in conversation with you. Um, so today we are speaking about open pedagogy and meta literacy. And just um, to give you an idea of what it is we will be talking about um, engaging students in self directed learning with open pedagogy, open pedagogy in practice, and I will be talking about that Wikipedia course the synergy between open pedagogy and meta-literacy, and then meta-literacy as scaffolding in open pedagogical learning situations. So how do we engage students in self-directed learning with open pedagogy? 
we have a quote from Abigail Adams, who says, learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. Uh, Abigail Adams uh, was the wife of the second president of the United States. She lived from 1744 to 1818. And seeking wisdom indicates an engagement with self-directed learning. We're all familiar with the idea of the student as an empty vessel um, for whom we have to pour in knowledge. And we know that this doesn't work and it isn't how learning occurs. So both the seeking and the attendance are the responsibilities of learners. So how do we encourage their ardor and diligence? Words that are uh, maybe a little bit dated, but um, I think are very su well suited to this. So the world of open, and I'm sure that many of you know uh, much of what I'm going to say here, but um, sort of looks like the layers of an onion. There's so many terms and ideas that are connected with the word open. Most encompassing is this disparate open universe, the outer navy blue sphere. The lighter blue is OEP, open educational practices, using open educational resources and teaching, publishing your works in open journals, or creating OER. It's, it's a very sort of wide area. The next ring down, the aqua ring, represents open educational resources, those works that meet the criteria outlined by David Wiley, um, that they can be reused, revised, retained, remixed, and redistributed. And then the, um, the full sort of navy sphere at the bottom encom encompasses open pedagogy, which generally uses OER, in a learning environment where students contribute content that provides value to others. And it's not simply seen by the professor. There is a lot of overlap between the use of the terms and even the definitions of the terms. So let's take a look at what I think is an excellent definition of open pedagogy, a framework for revising the practice of teaching, to engage students in actively shaping their learning and contributing to public knowledge. But what I think is really interesting about this is this came from EDUCAUSE and it's actually a definition of they use for open education practices um, rather than open pedagogy. So there really is sort of a lot of fluidity in these terms. Um, but let's take a look at sort of engaging students in actively shaping their knowledge, self-directed learning. And Tom, would you like to talk a little bit about this? Yes, Trudy, thanks for that great introduction. And so what we'd like to do is look at this very famous quote, of course, from Malcolm Knowles and really break down um, some of the key elements here, uh, the, the attributes of self-directed learning that really connect with open pedagogy. And as the uh, presentation continues, I think that you'll see also uh, connections later on with meta-literacy. But if we look at sort of how uh, Trudy has framed this, um, this is a really good start to thinking about where we're going so that uh, learners, self-directed learners take initiative and they do so either on their own or with teachers or with peers, they have the ability to diagnose their own learning needs. So they have a sense of their own strengths and their, their areas for continued growth. They formulate goals. So they are uh, clearly a part of sort of knowing where they want to go and really help lead themselves in that direction. They identify resources for self-directed learning. And one can imagine uh, the many different kinds of instructional resources that one would need. and thinking too of this digital world that we're in, the kinds of perhaps digital resources. They also develop strategies for self-directed learning. So again, they are empowered, they are fully engaged in their learning process, and they also have the ability to evaluate out outcomes so they can, they can self-assess their learning as well. 
So we'll see how this plays out as uh, Trudy continues talking about open pedagogy. Thanks, Tom. So renewable assignments are one very sort of tangible aspect that show up in open pedagogical learning um, environments. Um, this is where students generate materials and resources for the commons, okay? Um, which might be future students taking their course, might be students currently in the course, other formal or informal learners around the world. So the EDUCAUSE definition included the words contributing to public knowledge. And let's look and see what that means. So these renewable or non-disposable assignments ask learners to create resources and share knowledge with others, providing value for the commons. This commons might be one's own class, it might be the world. Um, so let's consider on the right here some examples that might qualify. There may be assignments asking students to create quiz questions, for example. This requires students to engage with course concepts in a way that's rather different than simply taking quizzes and answering those questions. Moving into the realm of open pedagogy, if a student has questions selected to actually be used on a quiz, there is a feeling of pride there may be generated, which may lead to enhanced engagement with the course. These questions may continue to be used in future semesters, so uh, there's a real contribution to the commons here. Another example of open pedagogy involves students or groups of students contributing content to an open textbook that is used in the course, but also made available to others. Students may create tutorials or educational media in a variety of formats that are shared online. Another example of open pedagogical assignment is the addition of content to Wikipedia, which I will delve into more um, when we get to the open pedagogy and practice section. So um, the benefits of renewable assignments are that students and instructors work collaboratively to add resources that really are of value to the world. Students may be more committed when they know that others are engaging with their content. Um, their creative potential and higher order thinking skills are engaged. And the resources that they create might serve as an, uh, an online portfolio they can share with others. Okay. So let's look more at the characteristics of open pedagogy. I put this diagram together from three sources, which are cited on the bottom of the slide. Um, both Hegarty and the trio of Reynolds, Gibbs, and Zemke developed attributes or qualities of open pedagogy. Interestingly, both lists were published in 2015 and both included eight items. What I have done here is collapse pairs of aligned qualities into a single category where they meshed and then included qualities that were just on one list and added the 21st century competencies from Osia Nelson. I think this is vitally important, the competencies, but wasn't in either of the other two sources. So over the next two slides, we'll examine these characteristics, but um, just, um, you've probably been looking at them, but choice responsibility, those competencies, openness of learning, participation, sharing, innovation and creativity, process, community interaction, and networks. So moving to the next slide, um, so networks, um, taking a look at both Hegarty and Reynolds et al., um, I've combined two different kinds of networks into one. Hegarty wrote about participatory technologies while Reynolds and um, Gibbs and Zemke were referring to learning networks. Very often learning networks need those participatory technologies, which are also required for making the open content available to others. The choice slash responsibility 
Um, self-directed learning, reflective practice. Self-directed learning is important for this characteristic, but it isn't the only choice that is in play. There's also the importance of one understanding one's own responsibility to others, which is where the reflective practice comes in. Participation. There's the connected community and also the student construction of knowledge. Students must choose to participate in open pedagogical environments and to take responsibility. Um, they need to monitor their learning and seek assistance when needed. Hegarty mentions that when students become fully involved in the learning process, something magical happens. And I think we've all seen that. And then sharing. For this characteristic, Hegarty was uh, referring to sharing ideas and resources, while Reynolds, Gibbs, and Zemke were thinking of sharing learning networks. But both are core elements of open pedagogy. Open is about sharing. So moving to the next slide, uh, community interaction, learning in an open environment can be nerve wracking for students. It is not the model they're used to. Sharing your work broadly can be a bit scary for some students. They have to open, be open to feedback from a wider group, not just their professor or even just their classmates. So Reynolds framing of this as risk and goodness captures the situation well. I mentioned the importance of 21st century competencies. Um, while it depends on a way in the way the professor is bringing open pedagogy into a learning situation and the assignments that are involved, often the ability to work in a networked collaborative environment is necessary. And students may need to learn to become adept in the platforms that are being used. Also, renewable assignments frequently expect students to be engaged and effective researchers, and so that information literacy comes into play. For openness of learning, this comes from um, Reynolds et al's list and can be thought of as unmeasurable outcomes. When a research paper is assigned, there's often a rubric that carefully details the desired outcomes. This makes grading a bit more cut and dried, um, although those of us who work with rubrics realize that that isn't always the case. But with open pedagogy, students may be following very different paths to reach a learning goal. And this requires a tolerance for these mutable outcomes. Uh, process, um, this is also from Reynolds' list, an emphasis on process is needed more than on product. Students may be, well be tackling open-ended real world issues and must be open to adjusting their path as they grapple with these issues. And then innovation and creativity. Again, this depends on the way that a professor is implementing open pedagogy, but there's often room for new creations, perspectives, and ideas. These characteristics provide a glimpse into the differences with closed pedagogy. Uh, often instructors start with one or two elements, gain a sense of confidence and competence, and then they add more. Students are asked to stretch themselves in unaccustomed ways. And there's a great quote about open pedagogy. And um, open pedagogy is not for the faint of heart not faint-hearted teachers or faint-hearted students. To some degree, it is like sewing your parachute after you have jumped from the plane. Now, learners may feel sort of fragile in open pedagogical situations, but if instructors sort of show their own vulnerabilities, their interest in learning new things, it can go a long way to bolstering students' growing confidence um, and can build an element of trust. So let's take a look at one situation um, with open pedagogy in practice. And that is uh, a Wiki EDU course program. This is a, 
Wiki Education Program is available in the United States and Canada um, with support from people in the program, uh, but there are materials that are available from them that can be used anywhere. And in these courses, students actually create content for Wikipedia. They go through a training program. And what you're seeing here is a dashboard. Um, so it um, tells that this is an information literacy in the humanities and arts courses. I have 18 students. They've made a total of 675 edits. They have added 12,000 plus words to Wikipedia with 102 references. There have been 1.3 million views of their work and they've uploaded two items to uh, the commons where um, images and such are um, available. And so you can see the impact of the work. Uh, the students who are doing this, and if we go to the next slide, I'll just um, show a little bit of their Content. Okay, so here is a contribution um, by a student who gave herself the name of Emma Adriana. She was working on uh, the Women in Philosophy article. Um, the next column, it's hard to tell what it was, but um, she was reviewing two articles. So Tom, if you could go back to the Women in Philosophy, thank you. Um, and so this is from the dashboard. What's highlighted is some of the content that she added to this article. Um, and um, the next part of the slide, I think shows some more. Yes, so she really did quite a bit. Um, students who are faced with this um, are um, a little bit um, concerned about the fact that they are doing something that is not just for their professor, but it is for the world and what responsibilities they have in doing this. So going to the next slide, um, just uh, briefly, I just wanted to mention some attributes of it. So, and these come from those um, ones that we looked at just a little while ago. So the networks, they're using the Wikipedia platform, the Wiki EDU resources, the community is the world. It is not the professor. Um, there's other Wikipedia editors looking at their work um, and they're going through peer review within my course, with another course at my university and with those other Wikipedia editors. So they have choices. Um, whether to remain in the course, is this a little daunting for them? Um, uh, virtually all do stay in the course. And then the Wikipedia article selection process, they get to pick the one they want to work on. They get to pick how they want to add content. So meta literacy is critically important. Tom will be talking about that in a moment. Um, there's also the information literacy component. Um, and framework concepts. So the information literacy framework, there are things such as information has value and information creation as a process that are very important to what the students are learning. They're sharing their knowledge, they're sharing sources with others, um, and then there is the whole process. So what is needed and what their ability is. So the last slide in this section, before I turn it over to Tom, is a quote from a, a student in my course a few semesters ago. So contributing to Wikipedia gives one the feeling of contributing to something real and meaningful. And that is, I think, the massive benefit of open pedagogy. So Tom, let me turn it over to you. Trudy, thank you so much. That is such an excellent discussion of open pedagogy. And now let's take a look at how open pedagogy relates to meta literacy. Uh, as you noted, uh, there's a need for those 21st century competencies. Uh, we did pull this one quote from the new book about meta literacy in a connected world and developing learners as producers, because it really gets to that point that you made that while we see the benefits of this, uh, learners 
uh, may find themselves in open pedagogical situations, they, they might feel some sense of anxiety or un uncertainty uh, about being in that kind of uh, environment and that kind of learning situation. So meta-literacy then provides this flexible open framework that scaffolds learning to support students uh, as, as producers. And, it, and it's so important that this idea of learners as producers is not just assignments, but it's these kind of renewable assignments where they're contributing to the commons, as you noted, which I think takes it to really a whole new level. So if we just kind of look as an overview and start this comparison of open pedagogy and meta-literacy, we can see that open pedagogy really opens up uh, new mediums for uh, learner work and contributions. So that with uh, meta-literacy, there's a focus on knowledge, sharing knowledge, uh, producing and sharing knowledge accurately and effectively. So that when they're working with uh, new media environments, there's a focus on sort of the effective use of those technologies. Open pedagogy supports personalized learning and meta-literacy really engages in this self-directed learning process. So the self-directed piece of this is important as well. Open pedagogy shifts roles and responsibilities and uh, in one of, uh, one of the roles that uh, we've identified as kind of shifting is this idea that learners are also teachers. So uh, one of the core concepts is that uh, learners are not just consumers, they're, they're also producers, but within this open pedagogical setting, because they're creating knowledge that they are then sharing within the commons, they also become teachers. From an open pedagogical perspective, uh, there's a focus on sourcing and sharing resources and meta-literacy provides supports because there's an emphasis on the responsibilities associated with producing, sharing and remixing content. So they're creating user-generated content, but they're also working with and contributing to the creative commons, for instance. Um, open pedagogy has uh, an emphasis on promoting diverse array of resources and meta-literacy uh, also emphasizes the ability to seek information from a wide range of viewpoints and sources. So those, those are themes that are built into the meta literacy framework. So let's take a look at that, look at the look at that in a, a bit more detail. So we'll look at this synergy between open pedagogy and meta literacy and look specifically at the, uh, the goals and learning objectives. So meta literacy has these four overarching goals. And then each of the goals has related care, or, I'm sorry, related uh, objectives. So just as kind of an, an overview here, goal one is to actively evaluate content while also evaluating one's own biases, which of course, if you're contributing to the commons, it's important to uh, recognize one's own bias in, in creating content. Uh, so related objectives include the ability to verify expertise, acknowledging that expertise actually does exist, uh, reflecting on one's feelings, how one feels about information, and being able to critically assess uh, information from a wide range of sources. Goal number two, engaging with all intellectual property ethically and responsibly, so that that eth ethical dimension is, is one of the key goals. So related objectives include producing information responsibly, being able to remix content in an ethical manner and sharing information appropriately. Goal three, a particular focus on producing and sharing information in collaborative and participatory environments. And those are the kinds of environments that, that we're in. So related objectives include being able to see oneself as an information producer, to be able to participate in a conscientious way and to really teach what you know, because you are contributing to the commons, you're contributing to these spaces beyond a learning management system, beyond just an assignment within a particular course. Goal four, develop learning strategies to meet lifelong personal and professional goals so that individuals really think of meta-literacy as a, a lifelong uh, objective, a lifelong goal, so that they, again, can assess their own learning, doing those self-assessments, they value the importance of flexibility and their effective collaborators uh, in this process. So that's just kind of an overview of the goals and learning objectives. And now let's take a look at some of the very specific um, 
open pedagogical concepts that Trudy introduced and align them with uh, meta literacy goals and objectives. So uh, this focus on media networks, content, which of course are always evolving and changing, that really requires learners to adapt to uh, different uh, technological situations, uh, and to do that in a really critical way, to ask questions about the technologies, but also be flexible enough to really try things out, to try new technologies, and to really think about how the technology has an impact on their learning. So that's goal four, objective six, and it focuses on the learning domains, the effective and the behavioral. So students are really thinking about sort of how they feel in these situations. Uh, also, it impacts motivation and self-perception within these environments. So meta literacy helps to really uh, emphasize those key aspects. So again, you can see how the, these goals and objectives reinforce the open pedagogical concepts. Community interaction is a key part of open pedagogical settings. Um, so meta literacy uh, provides this focus on the ability to effectively communicate and collaborate and shared spaces and to really learn from multiple perspectives. So let's go for objective seven. Um, that really uh, encourages learners to think about sort of their roles as contributors in these community spaces and to think about their responsibilities and to understand that learning itself is a, is a social process to begin with. Then if we look at another uh, open pedagogical concept, which is this focus on innovation and creativity. So again, contributing to the commons, this uh, Creative Commons logo is, is ideal for this. So that within this context, meta-literate learners really, um, there's an emphasis here to challenge yourself to formulate ethical and novel approaches to build upon the idea of others. So really understanding that research process and that it's okay to really work with openly licensed materials, to understand the ethical dimension of intellectual property and to see oneself contributing and to build upon uh, these ideas. Again, focusing on the effective and the metacognitive dimension of that. So learners are really re reflecting on their roles as creators of information, um, thinking about how they feel within these contexts, also impacts motivation uh, and kind of the self-perception of, of their own learning. Another aspect here of open pedagogy that aligns nicely with uh, meta literacy and where meta literacy supports open pedagogy, this focus on student choices and responsibilities in open pedagogical settings, so that uh, meta literacy focuses on engaging in informed, self directed learning. So, again, the sort of the behavioral dimension, sort of how we act and how we apply skills in these con con contexts, and also how we reflect on our learning in this process. So those are just a few examples that kind of show this alignment between meta literacy and open pedagogy and how meta literacy itself is, is reinforcing uh, the open pedagogical uh, concepts and, and scenarios. Let's look at how meta literacy uh, scaffolds learning and leading toward the development of a meta literacy mindset that prepares learners for a wide range of information situations. This is the overall uh, model, the overall meta literacy model that has the learning domains in the center, the learning learner roles and the, the outer ring. And then of course, these learner characteristics that learners, self-directed learners are striving toward uh, as meta literate learners. So let's kind of break this down a little bit and look at this in a different way. Look at these circles uh, in a new way of seeing how the learning domains are kind of um, the foundation for this learning and that um, meta literacy really scaffolds learning so that meta literate learners again the scaffolding can happen with instructors with peers uh, with participants in a social learning community so that we have the social that we have the learning domains the effective the behavioral the cognitive and the metacognitive we have the learner roles. Um, and again, think about this from an open pedagogical viewpoint that you know, it could be an author of a multimedia presentation, author of an essay, but also the focus on being a, a, an effective communicator, collaborator, participant, producer of information, publisher, researcher, teacher, and translator. Um, and then 
that supports these learner characteristics, which is really uh, what learners are striving towards. So it's kind of a breaking down this, this model in a different way and showing how it's also, we really see it as a, a, a model for scaffolding of learning. So if we look at these elements, these core components uh, that we've, we've already mentioned, it's the meta-literacy learning domains. Uh, we, we have a focus on the metacognitive, the cognitive, the effective, and the behavioral. So the metacognitive is a focus on reflective learning, so trying to gain new insights about your learning, but also uh, there's an aspect here of self-regulation where learners really take charge of their learning. So they are able to identify uh, the, where they are as learners and where they need to grow as learners as well. So they identify perhaps gaps in knowledge or, or what we really like to focus on areas for further development. The cognitive piece of course is what learners actually know and what they learn, uh, their comprehension. Um, and again, that can often is supported by the metacognitive, being able to reflect on what they know. The behavioral is really what uh, learners do, how they apply skills. So think about how they're applying skills in these open pedagogical settings. And then the effective, uh, really, it's the learner's emotions, their attitudes, their engagement in learning activities. So we really see this as a holistic model we can break these elements down and look at them separately, but we also see them working together um, because we see the meta-literate learner as this whole person who is engaging with all of these uh, learning domains and also becoming aware of the domains and how they fit into all this. The meta-literate learner roles are uh, essential to this process as well. So rather than just um, identifying particular objectives to work toward, we, the learners really see themselves as active meta-literate learners uh, in these specific roles. So some of these that we can see, such as being a producer, a participant, communicator, and we've highlighted here some that are uh, especially valuable as, um, as individuals are in open pedagogical settings and contributing uh, in social learning environments so that as a translator, learners are sharing their knowledge, uh, and they're, they're making information. Um, they really translate ideas uh, to help others better understand those ideas. As part of this, they also adapt ideas from one artistic form to another. And they also understand how one translates ideas from one media format to another. So if you think about the different media, uh, new media environments and in, in open pedagogical settings, that, that is a, a critical role for learners to play. Uh, because this is really uh, an environment where learners are also teachers, uh, individuals reflect on learning. They think about also how uh, as collaborators in these environments, they are also teaching others in these settings. They're also publishers. So they're thinking about how they curate information, compile it, share it, and they use a range of digital resources to do so. And so that they're thinking of some of the editorial decisions that go along with that. And they're also thinking of the, the media formats as well. And then another key one in open pedagogical settings is this idea of being a communicator so that learners reflect on how they communicate. Uh, they think about the accuracy of the content that they've developed um, and that they've also shared, transmitted in some way. They think about the audience for their work. And they think of also within these global contexts as well. So those are learner roles. Um, so if we kind of pull this all together and we think about designing open learning with meta-literacy, we've developed some uh, ideas here to kind of pull all this together so that with an open, open learning situation, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about embarking a, upon this, uh, consider the scope of open pedagogy that fits your course. So uh, start in a way that makes sense for you and works within that, that context. Uh, determine which open meta-literacy content meets your needs. Uh, at metaliteracy.org, we've, we've made all kinds of open educational resources available that you can apply in different contexts. We have interactive learning diagrams, we have videos, we have the goals and learning objectives, everything's open and available for you to use. Uh, also uh, adapt the meta-literacy goals and learning objectives to align with your own. They work 
as they are, but uh, we don't expect that you would exactly use them word for word. You may wanna adapt just the concept, the theme of a particular goal and objective. Also, encourage learners to envision themselves in those active meta-literate learner roles. We see those roles as really supporting self-directed learners in open pedagogical settings. And we know this may be new to you, this may be new to them, so that those envisioning oneself in those roles should help through the process. Um, inspire learners to identify their strengths and areas for continued growth, which is a key part of being a self-directed learner, being able to formulate their own uh, learning goals, and also develop learning activities that encourage that metacognitive uh, reflection. Because in many ways that meta and meta-literacy is the metacognitive piece, and through that reflection, um, it really further reinforces all of these goals of open pedagogy. So now I'm going to talk about the uh, meta-literate learner characteristics. So within this integrated model, these are really the characteristics that learners are striving toward. So if we look at this within the context of open pedagogy, we can see an obvious one like being open. So being open to new ideas and insights, learning situations, uh, that helps to foster empathy within these social learning communities and to also support uh, mutual understanding. And that's something we all need to do as, as, as teachers. This might be new to us. So trying to be open to that and really foregrounding that idea of what that means. Also, being adaptable to new uh, learning situations such as open pedagogy and also the, the some of the new media environments that might be involved as part of this. Uh, critically adjusting to evolving technologies while also being flexible to new ways of learning and to really understand how those technologies impact the learning and also the content itself. Um, being reflective, obviously the meta and meta literacy, fostering thinking about one's own thinking, self-regulating one's learning, uh, supporting the ability to um, identify and expand in specific knowledge areas. And because this is a social we're talking so much about social learning communities, this idea of being civic minded is a, is a really critical part, or it's a critical characteristic within this because it really reinforces our contributions and what our responsibilities are to our communities and of course the ethical dimension of that participation. So, We'd like to uh, close with a quote here, and I'm going to start uh, kind of talking about this, and then we'll open up for questions. But then Trudy's going to comment on this as well. And we we talked about a, a way to close today, a, a way to kind of frame this. And uh, so Trudy found the quote, and I found the image based on something that Trudy has done. So I think this shows gives you a sense of how we work together sometimes. So the quote, I think, really captures this idea of what we've been trying to talk about today, that inviting learners to share their work more widely demonstrates to them that their work has inherent value beyond the course and can be an opportunity for them to engage directly with their community. So again, learners as producers is not just producers of assignments, but really producers, uh, knowledge creators contributing to their world. Um, and here's an image actually from Trudy's Instagram, which I find continuously fascinating. It's not an area that I know a lot about, but she's been, uh, it's just uh, the images she, she uploads are these collections, which she can tell you about, but I think it really captures this idea um, that really sharing one's work more widely shows the value of this work. Uh, and I've just been fascinated by the images. I just think it's a beautiful image of the Instagram page itself. Uh, that really captures that idea, which I think is inspiring. So Trudy, why don't you uh, close today and tell us what this is all about? Okay, thanks so much, Tom. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I've got a book at the end of last year that was a collection a day, and it just inspired me. So I decided I would try to see how many collections I can put together and put on Instagram and uh, see what kind of a response. And it's been endlessly fascinating. I don't think I'm going to make it through 365 days, but I think I should make it at least halfway through the year. Uh, a couple of other people have done this, um, but I think what this is, is a process of self-directed learning for myself. And as I work with 
students and other instructors, the mentoring I'm doing with Wikipedia, it, uh, it puts me back in the role of a learner, getting used to Instagram, tagging, all sorts of things like that. And um, it, it's also just a lot of fun. Um, so we thank you very much for um, attending today and um, would ha be happy to try to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, dear speakers. Um, we've got a couple of questions already, and I'm going to start first off with Kate Hatzoff's uh, question here in the Q&A. Apologies for the surname pronunciation. Um, she asked how to keep students from going down the rabbit hole during this process. I, I assume she's talking about the uh, uh, renewable assignments process. Uh, well, let me just start with that. I, I think um, that time um, is part of what keeps them from going down the rabbit hole. And I'm, and please feel free to sort of expand upon the rabbit hole idea. But um, students know that they need to get a certain amount done in a certain amount of time. My hope when I use these, um, not re these renewable assignments in my classes is that students may continue to work on what they've started after the course has ended. Um, I do remember a couple of students who really did feel they go, went down the rabbit hole because they were topics that interested them greatly. And it gave them a platform for really delving deeply into these topics. Thank you, um, Trudy. I'm, I'm going to move on because there's a couple of comments and questions I want to share with you. Um, in the chat, we had, uh, first of all, a, a very good question from uh, Notili Kunene. Um, I think it relates to an extent to what we've just spoken about in terms of a renewable assessment, but uh, our dear colleague here from Northwest asked, doesn't the topic get saturated of questions in the open uh, resources or pedagogies shared when it's shared to the public? Could it be that only the first cohorts can make a significant contribution and the groups that follow have limited spaces or contribute their ideas? Do you have any views on that? So when I saw that question, the first thing I thought about perhaps was developing an open textbook for a course. And so the first cohort or the first two cohorts may tackle some of the main concepts, but I think changes are needed, um, revisions are needed, more topics might be included. So I think it depends very much on the particular renewable assignment. Um, the Wikipedia work that my students do, there's infinite possibilities, but this would have to be taken into account when an assignment is developed or continued from semester to semester. Tom, did you have additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's part of that idea of understanding how one sort of builds on prior work um, and that they're contributing to a, a conversation um, so I do think there's value in having students see sort of work that was done previously. Um, so we, in my digital storytelling course, we have actually a, a virtual museum where students can, if they want, see uh, previous uh, group projects and uh, um, uh, individual projects. I think it can be inspiring to them. Um, and I think in some ways it also creates a kind of structure for students who are new, new to the concept. Thank you. Uh, I'm moving on to a comment uh, by Igor Lesko from OE Global. Um, I like how you outlined practical application of open pedagogy principles to Wikipedia. And uh, I know uh, the Northwest University colleagues will have the opportunity to have a workshop in that regard. But there's an interesting question from uh, Professor Hove, who's also from Northwest University, is one of our deputy directors. And you can see from the, the question he's uh, involved in languages. He asked the prefix meta already subsumes the prior existence of literacies, does it not? In that respect, I'm right to assume that this meta literacies concept approach is addressed to scholars, researchers already inducted into the domains of knowledge generation and knowledge sharing. Do you have any comments uh, on, on that uh, question? 
I, I can start. Um, I think it's a it's a great question. I think that when we started with this, we 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 thought of the term because we were looking for a kind of overarching and unifying uh, framework. We were in those early that early work. We we analyzed other forms of literacy, such as media literacy, et cetera, uh, digital literacy. But we were what we were looking for. We weren't. We were not trying to um, kind of overtake any other literacies. What we were looking for were what are the what are the characteristics of other literacies that can move information literacy forward? Because information literacy at the time was very skills based, very kind of print text based, and we were we were trying to move it that way. We've also um, the meta and meta literacy has multiple meanings, so it also the focus on metacognition adds this whole other dimension to it that, as you can see with our discussion, is really key to it. So supporting reflective learning. And there's some other ideas too that, you know, the Greek origins of the word means beyond and after. So we've, we've used that as a kind of a way to think of moving beyond, you know, literacy, the reading and writing of, which is often associated with just like basic literacy. And then information literacy was often search, retrieval, evaluation. So we were thinking of moving beyond, you know, how do you move beyond those to have a, this literacy framework about the individual who is a social learner? So uh, it's a great question. And I think there's so much that can be explored with this idea of the meta. And I think this is really what's been so much fun for, you know, working with that, that prefix. Trudy? Yeah. And I just wanted to add that uh, with, with the roles and the characteristics, we're asking learners to see themselves more, not necessarily as scholars, but as um, proficient in areas. You know, if they apply the metacognition, if they understand their responsibilities, that they have the opportunity to not be uh, sort of novices, but can move on sort of to the next level. Thank you very much. I'm going to conclude with a question from Melissa Schillinger. Uh, she first of all says the shout out to my mentor, Tom and hello, Trudy, very interesting lecture. Uh, and then she asks, what is one thing you have enjoyed the most about your work over the years as you continue to research and expand on meta literacy? That is from Melissa. I would Melissa. just- Oh, go ahead, Trudy. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I would just say the opportunity to work with people all over the world and to get the feedback, such as we're getting today, and uh, it really expands our thinking. So, Tom, I didn't mean to to cut no. you off. No, no, no. I think we're so excited by the question. We both wanted to answer at the same time. <laughs> Melissa, thank you so much for joining today, and thanks for your excellent question. I think, yeah, I agree with everything Trudy said. The other aspect I'll add, and I'm sure she'll agree with too, is um, not only developing the theory of meta literacy, but there's been so much uh, in practice. So the way that we've been developing it in our own teaching and being able to apply these concepts has been so incredibly rewarding. Uh, and so working with you and working with other students has really been a, a real privilege and it's been very exciting to see these concepts in action. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, and I give over to uh, Dr. Dorothy Lobsher from Northeastern University to um, help us conclude this session. Over to you, Dorothy. Thank you, Prof. Yaku. And to Prof. Jacobson and Prof. Mackey, thank you so much for the presentation. What a privilege it's been for us to listen to your presentation and for sharing in all your insights, sharing in your experiences, in your research in meta literacy and open pedagogy. And thanks for showing how all of this connects to self-directed learning. Um, for those of us that are still learning about open pedagogy and how to design open le uh, learning with meta literacy, thanks for giving us a good idea of how we can prepare our parachutes before we take the jump. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. We look forward to meeting with you both again soon. And then last, but certainly not least, thank you to Prof. Elsa Mens, the director of the research unit self-directed learning for hosting the lecture. Thank you, Prof. Elsa, for making this prestige lecture possible. Thank you, colleagues.
thank you, colleagues from my side as well. I just want to, um, as was noted in the chat, uh, happy Women's Day and also um, happy Open Education Week. Um, thank you very much, colleagues, and may you have a great day further and a great week further. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you, Tom, Trudy, Yaku.